Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy and Joel, and you are listening to Revive Thoughts. So I ask you the question, do you want to be holy? And that question you should face. You should desire to be holy. That's right, it's Revive Thoughts, a show where every week we take a different voice from history in a sermon that they delivered today. We're listening to a sermon by John Broadus. It's a t- sermon titled, Jesus Prayed for Us, and it was preached in Kentucky sometime in the late 1800s. Uh, Troy, I'm excited uh, to be to be back at it this week. How are you doing this week? It's been a week since I talked to you. Yeah, it's been good. I'm great. I'm excited. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, great episode. Hope you listened to that one we just put out last week. And John brought us, we haven't featured him on the show um, in two years. So we have an episode by him before. Has it been two years? It has been. So it's been a while since we've seen John Broaddus come around. His sermon, though, I really highly recommend it. I'm pretty sure it was in my top. No, I know it was in my top 10 for that year. Lessons for the Tempted. If you have struggled with temptation in your life. And if you haven't, you're lying because every human has struggled with temptation. This is one of the best sermons I think you can possibly listen to. And that's not just my opinion. That's the opinion of everyone who who listened to it and wrote in and said, that was a great sermon. We really appreciate that one. So if you struggle with it, if you know somebody struggled with it, um, really go back and hit that John Broaddus one. And that was one of the, one of the things that motivated me to go, I got to get John Broaddus back on the show. And excitingly too, this doesn't get to happen to us all that often, but I love when it does. The guy who spoke the John Broaddus episode from two years ago is the same guy. It's actually almost the same exact time of year. That one came out at the end of July. This one's coming out at the beginning of August. So it just felt right, I guess. It was just time. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said of John Broaddus, if you don't, because you don't mind, I know him. You you might be listening going, who is this guy? Uh, But Charles Spurgeon said of him in his era, and he was alive at the same time. He is the greatest of current preachers living. During that time, A.T. Robertson, who we featured on our show not that long ago, also who had heard Joseph Parker, Charles Spurgeon, D.L. Moody, heard pretty much every famous preacher speak at the time, said that Broadus could preach as good as absolutely any of them. But what makes Broadus interesting to me, what I think is kind of interesting about this, is all those other guys are full-time pastors, full-time preachers. Every Sunday they're seeing their congregation. Broadus, by trade, was not a preacher. He was actually a professor who would get invited sometimes to preach. Yeah, bro, he was def- he's definitely one of those guys that uh, we put into the not very famous category. Uh, you know, Troy mentioned you might not know who he is. I certainly didn't know who he was before doing Revive Thoughts and, and doing an episode on him. But um, a really fascinating individual, a really great speaker in the way that he would think about uh, formulating sermons. He had a great respect for how to articulate uh, and encourage other believers through the art of sermons. But again, from, a, from an analytical point of view, from a professor point of view, which is what he was, born in 1827 in Virginia. He was homeschooled by his uncle uh, and never had any you know formal training himself. Despite growing up in a Christian household, it wasn't until he was 16 that he uh, came to salvation and it was at a revival. And this would have been around the time of... Well, what some people call the the second great awakening in America. We did an episode on Azahel Nettleton, who is often you know attributed with starting the second great awakening in America. So so that's the time frame we're talking about. Again, kind of going going is the early eighteen hundreds going into the mid eighteen hundreds. There, John's testimony uh, of salvation. You know, he describes this revival where the preacher is preaching, and one of his friends there challenges him, encourages him to believe on this specific promise that the preacher was talking about, the preacher was preaching on John 6, 37, which says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no way cast out. And from that moment, Broadus' life w- was changed in his heart and desire for God. Uh, definitely there was that that transition, that shift to where it was unlike his life before. It, it's kind of This part's kind of funny to me. So, so often if you go to church, you'll hear people, you know, get involved, volunteer, or get in there and help the younger people or get in there with the Sunday school, um, teach some of those people, lead a Bible study. And that's kind of exactly what Broadus did when he got serious about his faith and got converted. He just kind of immediately jumped into leading a Sunday school at his local church. 
And he stayed there for years. That was really all he did. And while on the side, he determined to, I'm going to teach myself Greek. I think he got saved uh, in, in 1843. I think the next year he was like, I started, I'm going to learn Greek so I can grow in my faith. And for two years, he taught himself Greek. And that might not sound like a big deal, but remember, like, they don't have Duolingo. Right? They don't have anything online to help him. Uh, he has whatever books you can find in rural Kentucky to teach your, you know, actually, I think he was living in Virginia at the time. So whatever you can find in rural Virginia to teach yourself Greek. And, you know, it's not like there's any Greek scholars probably nearby. He has to teach it to himself all by himself. Um, and it's, he, he says it's one of the hardest things he ever had to do. It took him two full years, but he does successfully teach himself the Greek, so that he can, you know, have that closeness and understanding of what's going on in the New Testament. These are uh, some of my favorite types of moments in Revive Thoughts. It's not when someone is famous and preaching to tens of thousands and everyone loves every word and hangs on every word. Those are those are great moments, of course. But me, my favorite moments are like the moments before these guys become famous, when they're quiet, they're faithful, they're just doing what the Lord is is wanting them to do, serving quietly and faithfully years before they know they're ever going to be anybody, right? Like they don't know where they're heading. They're just serving God. The guy's teaching his Sunday school class and he's teaching himself Greek. You know, and I just think those are really cool. Those are the moments where, you know, the people who would have been watching him would have been like, we love Broadus. He's great. He's, you know, a great member of the church. No one would have thought 30 years from now he'd be one of the most important Baptist speakers in all of American history. Now, Broadus was so good at running the Sunday school that eventually they kind of bumped him up the superintendent of the area, which is a nice little, I don't think he's getting paid though. It's just a nice little volunteer bump up. Uh, he considered being a pastor at this point. He really thought, you know, maybe, uh, but instead he chose, I think I should be a doctor. And as he's preparing to go off to school to become a doctor, uh, he went to kind of a Baptist church meeting conference association thing. Joel, I'm sure you've had to be go to some of those kind of things where they're mm -hmm. talking specifics. And during one of those Baptist, you know, style meetings, they have a sermon. And this guy uh, gets up. He himself was a pretty famous preacher that was moving through the area. And he just preached a sermon about giving up your talents to God, you know, preaching on the passage of give up the talent. And the guy specifically said, give up all your talents, your speaking talents, your mental talents, not just your physical or your money. And something about that sermon hit Broadus. And he realized going into being a doctor was his way of keeping his mental talents for himself. And he realized, I am supposed to surrender that to God. I think I'm supposed to go into ministry and not become a doctor. I was holding on to this part of my life that I thought I could separate but I realized I need to surrender all of my talent in life to God. And so he chooses instead to now go into ministry. Yeah, so he he actually got married around this time as well. 1850, he got married. Uh, and he also went to school for formal education in education itself. He, he learned, go to school to learn to be a teacher, to be a professor. 1858, uh, he would officially get invited to be a member of, of a new school and a brand new facility that was being built, being established, a brand new seminary called the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. It was being founded at this time here, 1858, and Broadus uh, was one of the, the founding professors of it and was fully invested in seeing it through, seeing it established, which turns out, you know, it would need a lot of dedication to keep it established, to keep it running because 1858, we're just a few years off of the Civil War, the American Civil War. So uh, once the American Civil War comes, there's no students to go to seminary anymore because they're all fighting in a war. Uh, and you have an empty, a uh, brand new, you know, fully staffed with all the professors and nothing to teach till students, you know, are able to come back to, to take classes. Brodus uh, famously quote, has this quote, this line where he says, if Southern Baptist Theological Seminary will die, let it die after we professors do. Just saying, you know, we're, we're, let, let's be all in on this. Let's do everything we can to make uh, this school stand the test of time to outlast us, if nothing else. During the Civil War, Brodus served as a chaplain in the South during that time. So this is my least favorite part of the episode. Um, John Broadus was a Southerner during the early part of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary's founding. So his views on race and slavery were, you know, what you would kind of expect. They're not good. He is thought to have had slaves before the South officially lost the war. He was a Confederate chaplain, and he definitely had views on race uh, that as someone who owned slaves, we would not agree with today. Certainly not good ones. However, his views changed over time. 
And I think that's something we, I like to give him credit for. Uh, he eventually agreed and publicly stated that, look, slavery was evil and it's good that it's over. He also eventually publicly said that men on both sides had good reasons for the war and that it was a good thing the South had lost that war. Now, to you and me in the 21st century, that may not sound like much. That might not sound like much of a conciliation, and we would like him to have a lot better statements on this. But I do try to give him some grace because he's in the middle of the South telling people whose dads and brothers and who themselves had fought in that horrible civil war, uh, speaking to the Confederates. And he's basically saying to them, we were wrong. Slavery was evil. It's good we lost. That is, I think, commendable because that's not, um, I think it would take a little bit of courage, a little bit of bravery to look people in the eyes who may have lost their eyes fighting that war and say, yeah, but it's kind of good we lost, isn't it? Because that was bad, wasn't it? At a time when the North and South did not get along, he was extremely well-respected on both sides. When he was not uh, doing his professor work, he was highly sought after everywhere, from Detroit and St. Louis to Brooklyn and Boston. He would often preach in New Jersey as well. In fact, it was men like Broadus that kind of helped bring unity and healing back into the country, and especially academic respect to the Southern Baptist movement, and kind of move them past their founding, which wasn't great, and started to get them to the point of going, okay, but what they have to offer now isn't too bad. Brown University, Georgetown, University of Chicago, and several other institutions of higher learning attempted to get Broadus to come over to them and be the president of their school. And several, I mean, what we'd consider today mega churches, when their head pastor stepped down, they begged John Broadus to come be the replacement pastor. And I think it's pretty commendable here, too, because Broadus could have easily, you know, gone down as a Spurgeon uh, over some of these places could have been the DL Moody of America could have uh, been you know one of these big hotshot presidents but every time that happened he said no I you know I appreciate you thinking of me I I, w- I wish you all the best but the Lord has called me to serve a Southern Baptist Theological Seminary as a professor and I'm going to commit to that so he stayed in that one position as a professor going around and doing guest speaking uh, but never leaving it for about, I think it was like 36 years, which again, he had so many opportunities to advance himself, to get his name out, to get his stuff out there. But he stayed in that position where he thought he could impact uh, generations of pastors beyond himself as they went out to serve after being taught by him. In 1870, Bradis published a book on sermons called Treaties on Preaching, which sounds boring. I'm sure. I'm sure it's a. I'm sure it's a great. I mean, it was <laughs> that was a was, hot seller in 1871. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe a, a PR team could have come up with a better title than Treaties on Preaching, but uh, I'm sure. I mean, it it was a hot seller. It was very popular. It was the Southern Baptist Seminary's uh, teaching book on preaching book of choice for for decades, for several decades to come. Um, this is what they would use to teach people how to preach out of. And it, it may be because sermons altered Broadus's life so much. He, he took such interest in, he was very serious about making sure people could communicate well and preach well. Uh, he says that preaching is the mode that Christ communicates himself to so many and that Christ himself had been a great preacher of truth. You know, so he's looking at Christ's life and saying, you know, look how Christ communicated themselves. This is important for us to be able to do ourselves. There was a path uh, near the seminary, a footpath where the grass had been worn all the way down just, just due to foot traffic. And that was all due to Broadus pacing back and forth while he worked on sermons, preparing them and, and, you know, reciting them and and getting them ready to preach. Again, he wasn't a pastor at this time, but he did so much guest speaking uh, that he preached so much. Uh, He's credited with over 200 conversions, including Lottie Moon was was one that uh, attributes her salvation to a John Broadus sermon there. And he has he has a great reputation. He has all these stories that people talk about him, talk about how much he cared for people. Um, for example, there's this one instance where in one of his classes he had a, a student that was blind, and he completely rewrote the entire curriculum, the entire class, to accommodate this blind student and make sure they weren't being left behind in any way. We could continue on in his life. He was one of the earliest founders of the Sunday School Bo- School Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, which is not the catchiest name. So then it was eventually renamed the Baptist Bookstore. 
Um, but then that eventually came to be what you've probably heard of if you uh, live, especially if you live in the United States of America, Lifeway. So that's a pretty big Christian publisher today. And he was one of the very, like, very influential in having that store founded. His fame and acclaim and many awards, we could go on about all these kind of great things he did. But I think one of the stories I really like that represented his style of preaching and who he was, uh, he said that, look, preaching needs to be simple, so simple that anyone can understand it and they can grow from it. And he w- was one time preaching pretty early on in his ministry in a man that they called him a simple man. I'm not going to try to read too much into what that means, but it, the man was, he was considered a simple man who understood what he was saying is how I heard, read it. Uh, but he became a genuine believer, and every time he saw Abradas, he would run into him and say, thank you, thank you, John. And But he kind of said, like, with a little accent, thank you, John. I think that was kind of more of a southern twang. Anyway, but every time he saw him, thank you. From that moment on, that guy knew Abradas was the guy who had helped bring him into Christianity. He said, that's the kind of common sense, straightforward preaching that serves best, that we're not looking for the most intellectual, metaphorical, you know, beautiful language. We're looking for straightforward Everybody should be able to understand the gospel. And if you can do that well, then you've done a good job. You will see it, I think, in the sermon that you are about to listen to. I pray for them. John 17, 9. We are told in the text of something that Jesus does for us. Do I say rightly that he does for us? He said, I pray for them. And he was speaking immediately of the little company of men who were right around him, the disciples. And on the evening before the crucifixion, at the close of the farewell address, he said, I pray for them. But you remember how a little later he said, I do not pray for these alone, but for them also which will believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. Through them and their word, the circle would widen itself and continue to widen until it should embrace all that should ever become believers in him. I invite you, dear Christian friends, to take this prayer in the 17th chapter of John as giving you an idea of what sort of things the Lord Jesus Christ is asking for now on your behalf. Oh, that it may come home to us as a downright reality that the Savior, who ever lives, prays for you and me, knowing us better than we know ourselves, and that such things as these are the things for which He prays. First then, Notice this petition. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from evil. What a common mistake it is among men to think that the only object Jesus Christ has with reference to the human race is to gather a few of them out of this world's destruction and carry them to the better world. But he said, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from evil. He was going out of the world, and his heart longed after those who had been with him. They wondered why they could not go with him, and one even said, in self-confident fervor, I am ready to go with you to death. But he said, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. Many good people think hard of themselves because they do not want to die. I have heard such persons say, Ah, me! I am so unwilling to die. I think anyone that loves God ought to be willing to die. Well, that is against nature. It is impossible. It is wrong. The Lord Jesus Christ proposes not merely to rescue some souls from this world's ruin, but to rescue them in this world and make them live in the world as they were meant to live, by the help of His grace. This world belongs to him, and what he proposes is to take some of those, all that will come to him, that are oppressed by sin, and to help them here to live a life such as they should live. The idea that a person who is healthy and young, with opportunities of usefulness, should want to die is absurd. Yet many people misunderstand the matter and think hard of themselves that they love to live and shrink from the idea of dying. 
when people should live a long time in the nature of things and find nothing to live for, something is wrong with them. They may be maddened by dissatisfaction with life or by intolerable distresses in life, mad from life's history, glad to death's mystery, swift to be hurled anywhere, anywhere out of the world. I read that Elijah lay under a juniper tree in the desert and requested for himself that he might die. Yet really, I suppose, there had been no time for many years when he was not better fit to die than at that moment. In answer to his prayer, an angel came with food that he might eat and lie down and sleep again, and getting up might go work in God's service. Often when people are whining that they do not want to live, What they really need is food and sleep and exercise so that they may be ready to serve God. Now is that your desire? You feel many anxieties about life. You talk about the dangers of life. Is it your great struggle to escape evil, to live without sin? I do not know how it is with you, but I know how it is with Him. He ever lives to intercede for you and he prays that you may be kept from evil. Then the second prayer, Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. You observe he does not merely pray that they may be kept from evil, but that they may be made holy. There is a common error among men about the service of Jesus Christ. The idea that it is merely a negative thing, that he proposes merely to keep them from doing evil. To keep them from doing harm. Some people think all there is in religion is to try to avoid doing harm when Jesus goes on praying that they may be made holy. Piety is not a mere negative thing. The Ten Commandments, I know, are all in negative form. You shall not. Even so, Christianity reveals that this is but one side and that the other side, the nobler and more glorious side of piety, is that we must not merely try to keep from doing wrong, but try to do right. Jesus prays not simply that they may be kept from evil, but that they may be made holy. My Christian hearers, I should be reluctant to ask any of you whether you think that you are holy, because those whom God would regard as holiest would be most pained to have such a question asked of them. So I ask you the question, do you want to be holy? And that question you should face. Oh, men and women, you should desire to be holy. In any way, Jesus wishes that for you, and he prays, make them holy. Make them holy through your truth. Your word is truth. It is truth that makes men holy. Earth's unholiness began with a lie that made men believe and so went headlong to ruin. Truth is the lifeblood of piety. Truth is the medicine for the soul's disease. Nobody is ever made holy except through truth. Blessed be God. It often works its healing work, though it's sometimes sadly mingled with error. The truth, though it be adulterated with error, may yet through God's blessing work its healing, saving, and sanctifying work. But it is only the truth that does the work. Make them holy through your truth. Pilate asked the question, What is truth? He asked the question the next morning, and here was the answer the night before. Your word is truth. We know that word, and we may use it as the great means of becoming holy. Here, my brothers, I wish to offer you practical advice. I offer it as the result of a good deal of observation among Christian people and of my own efforts amid a thousand weaknesses and shortcomings to lead a better life. My advice is this. Regard the Bible more than you have been as what we use as the means of becoming holy. Regard the Bible as the great means of making you better, of making you good, Use the Bible for that purpose. I know how it is, and you will pardon me for telling you. Many times you do not love to read your Bible. 
The truth is, you take up your newspaper a second time and go on looking for something else in it when the Bible is lying neglected by your side. Then, when you do take the Bible, you feel that it is rather dull reading. Now, my advice is, learn to regard the Bible more as the way of making you better, of making you holy. When you read it in private or hear it in public, educate yourselves to view it as the great way of making you better, of strengthening you, of correcting your faults, of helping you to know your duty and helping you to do your duty. Fill your heart and mind full of the teachings of God's Word, hoping it will make you better, and this course will interest you in the Bible. You will take more interest in hearing the preacher read it from the pulpit and explain and impress upon you its teachings if you listen with the idea, How I hope this will help me! So in private, read the Bible with the thought, How I pray this may do me good! Please remember this suggestion and act upon it. Now let us consider the third petition, that they all may be one, that they all may be one. Ah, I see Jesus Christ standing in that night hour with his little company of eleven. I see him sending his thoughts down the coming years to dwell upon those who through these should believe in him, and his heart went out toward them, praying that they all may be one. I see Jesus Christ bending now from the Mediator's throne with endless solicitude for every human heart that looks lovingly up to Him. And knowing them all in all, the sheep of His flock on earth, and praying still that they all may be one. Now, my brothers, you expect me to turn around and say to you, it is not so. You expect me to contrast with this prayer the sad divisions of the Christian world but I will do no such thing. It is so. The prayer is answered. You say, very imperfectly answered? Certainly, and so in that other prayer, sanctify them, make them holy, that is very imperfectly answered, and yet you would not deny that it is answered. You may deem it strange that Jesus prayed that his people might be holy, and that they are so unholy, Yet you do not say his prayer is not answered. In like manner or to this other prayer, Christ's true people are one. I rejoice in it and thank God. When my heart is sad at the outward divisions of the Christian world and sadder in contemplating the bitterness that so often attends these divisions, then I turn for consolation to the thought that all that truly trust in Jesus Christ, that all who love Jesus Christ in sincerity, are one. They are more one than they know, and in proportion, as they are united to the Redeemer, they are united with each other. I have seen differences in families, and yet I knew they were one, notwithstanding this temporary unkindness and alienation. So among Christ's children, all that are truly His are one. Moreover, This prayer is to be more fully answered only in the same way that the previous prayer was to be fulfilled. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Yes, and that they all may be one. Through your truth. The more gospel truth we know and believe and love and live by, the more we will be one. My friends, it seems to me that here is one of the great problems of the day in which you and I are called to live, to know how to cling to gospel truth in a spirit of broad kindliness toward those who differ from us as to what is gospel truth. Many people are so possessed with the idea that everything must be sacrificed for the outward union of Christians that they shrink from maintaining their views as to what is gospel truth, out of fear from the notion that this would interfere with Christian union. Some have so liberalized the Christian faith that they say, do not blame a man for his belief. It does not make much difference what a man believes. That is, There is no assured truth. One thing is as true as another. On the other hand, there are people who set their heads upon certain views of truth, 
I did not say their hearts, until there is not anything in the whole horizon of their view but those particular tenets which distinguish them from their fellow Christians. Now it is a fact that men are made better only by truth, and that Christians will be made more thoroughly one only through truth. It is folly to sacrifice truth for the sake of union outward union. The practical problem we have to solve is how to maintain supreme and sovereign devotion to God's truth, and yet deal in all loving kindness and generous affection and hearty cooperation with all those that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. You say it is hard to do both of these things? Of course, it is hard to do anything well, always hard to do right and to do good with this poor human nature of ours. I mention one more petition. Recall those we have had. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from evil. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth, that they all may be one. And now finally, Father, I will that they also, whom you have given to me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. They had seen this humiliation, those who accompanied him, and he longed that they might be with him to behold his glory. He offers the same prayer for all that should believe in him through their word. There are two reasons why Jesus Christ made this petition. He asked it partly for his own sake. Did you never imagine that he was sad at leaving his disciples? You know that they were sad, but wasn't he? Did you never suppose that he longs to have those who love him more immediately with him? He said to his disciples, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God and believe in me, and it will all be well. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you for myself. As the father taking leave of his family to go to a foreign country might say, Now it is very sad that we are to be parted, but I am going to get a home for you, and when I get a home, I will come back to you and take you there with me. He says it is not only to comfort them, but more than they know, perhaps. He says it is to comfort his own heart also. And so Jesus said that they may be with me where I am. He wants to have his people with him. But the other reason is more obvious to us. He made the prayer for their sake. He makes the prayer for our sake. I will that they also, that you gave me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. To be with him is to be delivered from all the sicknesses and imperfections and conflicts of this earthly life. I do not suppose we could bear all this if it were not for the fact that it is to end and to end in victory. I suppose we should give over the struggling effort to do right and to do good in this world were it not for the assurance that we will at last be conquerors and more than conquerors through him that loved us. To be with him will be to be with all who have loved us and who have gone before us to him. To be with him is to be free from all sin and safe, safe, oh my soul, safe from all temptation to sin. To be with him is to behold his glory. So the Savior prays for us, and how grateful we are. Let us strive to fulfill his petitions that one day we may be with him. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Revived Thoughts. Today's sermon was narrated by Justin Scott Ray. Justin Ray is the founder of soundinworship.com a website designed to point Christians to worship music from theologically sound sources. We, Joel and I, are about to record another part two of the Ethiopia deep dive for all of you who are listening. However, this deep dive is only available to those of you who are signed up with us on Patreon. We encourage you to sign up with us on Patreon. The links are easy to find, and it really does help us out a lot. And for your listening pleasure, you will get access to the Salem Witch Trials deep dive, the 
first crusade deep dive the joan of art deep dive and now part two and all uh, ongoing parts of that of the ethiopia deep dive so please and most importantly it really helps us do what we do we make most of the money that comes into our studio comes in through patreon comes in through people who are helping us grow our studio and so it is a big thank you to those of you who are doing that and we really appreciate it this is troy and joel and this is revive thoughts This summer, when the sun's down, turn up the fun at Cedar Point Nights. The ultimate After Dark Beach Party is every night from July 29th through August 21st. Dance with throwback DJ sets, challenge your friends with beach games, or just take it easy at fire pits lining Cedar Point's legendary mile-long beach. Then enjoy the new Lake Erie Luau, a food experience like no other. For a limited time, get park admission, luau tastings, and parking for just $69.99. Only at cedarpoint.com. 